Good morning, church. I know you're deep in conversation. I want you to have fun and have that conversation as part of the, the richness and joy of life and having fellowship in God's church and God's family. But we do need to get started. There's some people waiting at home with their slippers on and in their pajamas and a cup of coffee. And so uh, they want us to get started. So we're going to get started. I want to remind you that on the 31st of this month, which is all Hallow's Eve, we are going to be having our trunk or treat out in the parking lot. The fire company has agreed to be present to help uh, distribute uh, and awesome uh, treats, but also to be present so kids can climb aboard and learn a, a little bit about the fire company and, and the fire truck, which is always fun for them. And all we need to do is just uh, decorate the trunks of our car. If you are so moved, like Tammy does, we dress up and we, um, and I do too, and then uh, we dress up and we hand out those treats as kids come by. So please be praying that the weather is going to be good so the kids don't have to worry about the inclement weather and that they then can come by. Um, also, we want to remind you that October 31st is All Saints Sunday. And in All Saints, we lift up and honor those people we love uh, and love who were a part of us or uh, a part of our lives but have gone to the eternal glory. So uh, we have a need. We're having some problems with our sound equipment because uh, our uh, mixer burned out, and so we're on a bottle of mixer, and our, our amp, power amp, is antiquated. So uh, it's been recommended that we replace both. So what we're, we thought we'd do is that we give you an opportunity, if you'd like to honor the memorial, uh, someone you love, you can give a gift, just put on it uh, uh, technology uh, on the bottom corner, and that, that money will go to help secure our new mixer and power amp. And uh, also send me a picture in the name of the person you wish to, to honor. Because during that service of the 31st, we will project those and broadcast those. And we'll have a moment of silence just to remembrance as those names are read, to lift them up and to celebrate the gift of their lives uh, to us. And we've had several deaths this past year we'll make sure that they're also included. So that's the only announcements that I wanted to give to you. This is Friendship Sunday, and Julie was very good. She brought a friend. So as what we're supposed to do. So I'm just scolding you in a nice way. Next, the third Sunday of next month, bring some along with you, okay? She brought Nathan, and it's nice to see you. He's got a great name, the name of one of my sons. And uh, so we just praise God for that. Welcome. Nathan. Without further ado, um, let us then begin our time of worship. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. He told me I had to yell so you could hear me through the sound system. So I'm going to yell. Oh, what a beautiful morning, oh, what a beautiful day. I've got a beautiful feeling, everything's going God's way. I know that it's raining out and none of us like it. And as I was on my way here, I saw a lot of lawns that were no lawns. They were all water. And so that means that people aren't happy, but we got to be thankful share a little bit of experience. I know we're tough for time, but did you ever stop to think that God has a plan for us each and every moment of our life? Last Sunday after church, my neighbor, he went with me because I was trying to get something I needed man's help, went into Home Depot and looking around for something, and then I saw this nativity scene with LED lights. And I've been wanting a nativity scene in the front of my house for years. $149.99, which comes out to 150 plus tax. And so, <laughs> so anyhow, I went and checked. They were all out of them. They had all of the other ones, but not that one. They called. They said that DeWitt had one. I ran down there. 
I said, I understand you have them. Yeah, we do. They're in thing, but they haven't been brought in enough to put into the computer, so she couldn't even hold it for me. So I decided it was God's will that I wasn't supposed to be having it. Not that he didn't want me to have the nativity scene, but he knew that I had received a couple of bills uh, out of the ordinary in the mail, and I think he felt I needed to put that money into those bills. It was more important to do that than to have the nativity scene. Because it's not what I display, it's how I feel and live my life to glorify him, which I hopefully do the way he wants it done. I just had to share that with you. Let's do our call to worship. Praise the Lord, O my soul. Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. He wraps himself in light as with a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent and lays the beams of his upper chambers on their waters. He makes the clouds his chariot and rides on the wings of the wind. He makes winds his messengers, flames of fire his servants. He set the earth on its foundations. It can never be moved. You covered it with the deep as with a garment. The water stood above the mountains, but at your rebuke, the waters fled. At the sound of your thunder, they took to flight. They flowed over the mountains. They went down into the valleys to the place you assigned to them. You set a boundary they cannot cross. Never again will they cover the earth. We have a witness of Sir Isaac Watts, W-A-T-T-S. Isaac Watts was known as the father of English hymnody. He had a fervent concern for the dismissal state of congressional singing that had developed during the late 17th and early 18th centuries. Most hymns were dull and lacked enthusiasm. Although he never married, Isaac Watts always loved children who always showed exuberance in life and openness to God. In 1715, he wrote a book of songs, especially for young people titled Divine Songs for Children. This hymnal, the first ever written exclusively for children, includes the text for, I sing the mighty power of God. It should be sung vibrantly. How important it is, whether a child or an adult, that we recognize and praise the mighty power of our Creator God. This hymn teaches us that we should, of His goodness and wisdom, as well as His omnipresence, God's people have much to sing about. Let us sing this hymn with gusto as Isaac Watts intended, and as God deserves, and our praise of him. And so shall we, we invite sing. you to rise and lift your voices with honor. The tune will be different than the one you have in your hymnal, but one that's familiar and you will enjoy. Oh! 
what the you have made. But from what we do know, through our senses, we recognize both your eternal awesome power and divine nature as the architect of all things good and beautiful. We confess that when we allow you to control life as you designed it to be, that you bring order out of the chaos we bring to it from our futile attempts to control. The founders you established are for our blessing because for some reason, us so much and are at the center of your attention. We thank you for the gifts of life, for your revealed presence in it, and for the gift of grace and hope offered us through faith in your Son, Jesus. May our worship bring joy to your heart, for it's offered in his name. Amen. Will you join with me in the affirmation? makes the land to bear gifts in this time and fills our tables with the bounty of his hand. I believe in Jesus Christ, his son, who is the first fruit of those who sleep now and death, and who brings us to spiritual tables where our cups are always full. I believe in the Holy Spirit, who causes us to remember all things for which we should be grateful, and teaches us to see a relationship between our gifts and the giver. I believe the world is the arena of my spiritual life, where I am to share my table with the poor, and my hospitality with a stranger. For in doing so, I shall fulfill the desires of him who has given me everything good, and of his son, my guide in life, and the Holy Spirit, the constant companion. Amen. Thank you, Mary. As we gather together, we lift up and celebrate. We sang to her, uh, so that's why she's not here. We sang to her last week uh, to uh, Sandy Figgy. We also have lift up Joshua Penoyer. And his mom's here and his grandma's here, so they would say, send him a card. If you don't have his address, just ask those two back there, and they'll be glad to give it to you. Okay? Just pour out love on other people, even if we don't see them. We thank God for the recovery of Eileen Carr, and who is present with us today. Hallelujah. We praise God for your healing. And you look good, too. I think you lost some weight through this ordeal. Yes, okay. <laughs> We also celebrate Erin Price. We prayed for her. She actually died of COVID and was resuscitated, and she's recovering. And I mentioned that a week ago, uh, last Friday, uh, I sat across the table at Cracker Barrel and celebrated my mother-in-law's birthday, and she was doing quite well. We also, uh, I asked her. She always gives us a couple waves on the computer. I think she's probably there. Is she Kathy? Yep, she's there. Oh, she is? No, okay. But uh, Esther Williams, in her healing, she had surgery on her foot. She's still working. She was in her boot, and she's out of her boot, I think. And so he thanks you for uh, your prayers for her. We do want, we're missing, of course, Sharon Starr. She uh, lost her husband, Doug, and so she's taking care of business. And that business is also, you know, the, the public civic business that is intrusion upon us, unfortunately, when we lose someone we love, but also she's taking care of business for her own spirit and soul. So if you'd be lifting up Sharon in your prayers, I'd appreciate that. I lift up, we've prayed for him in the past. This young man was 32 years old. I was privileged to have him in Rochester in the confirmation. He was a very active participant in the church that I was pleased to serve there, and he has a wife and uh, I can't remember, I know two boys, three, three children. And uh, Alex, can, uh, he was also preparing for the ministry and serving in the ministry. And uh, he uh, developed cancer, and he was in hospice, and he uh, died this, this past week. So I'd be praying for his family and the disruption of their life. I'd remind you, as I do at most funerals, that funerals are useful to us. 
and had one for Ruth Peckham yesterday in Liverpool. And then we also had a gravesite uh, in which a great storm arise. No one under the tent stayed dry. And the wind almost blew the tent down. And so I said to Ron Peckham, uh, who's part of our men's Bible study on Monday mornings, uh, I said to him, I think your mother was saying, enough is enough, get on with life. She, uh, she lived to be 105 and a great woman of faith. But uh, we want to remember that family as well. There's a wonderful celebration as their family is just a strong family of faith, young and older, and it was just a neat celebration. So I thank God for that. Uh, there's other concerns before you from Teresa Tracy, who has end-stage leukemia, related to our church, Kay Ingalls from Jamestown. She related to our church, and she has cancer. Uh, Ken Jackson, um, Eddie Betts, of course, Ann Miller, Harriet Bullis. Um, uh, a young man named Stephen we're praying for. Jen Beck, Blackburn, many others. Um, Jean Mumford. And this is only a partial list of those who we lift up in prayer. We may not always know what their need is. That's not the issue. You know, prayer is not necessary to bring God's attention to our needs and our wants. Prayer is meant to transform us, to turn our hearts to the needs of others. And that's one reason why we pray. Prayer is a gift that God has given to us. And so we want to remember the needs we have for prayer, including the refugees that invade our border uh, for the uh, officers and uh, police uh, and our leaders of our government. Um, we pray for the end of civil strife and an end to this pandemic. There are many other things we pray for. But let's take these time, this time in silence. And I don't have to speak. Let God speak. Listen, if you don't have a word that you don't know how to express what you want to express, just thank God because he provides you with the Holy Spirit. He conveys the desires of your heart to God because that spirit is present. That spirit is present with you right now. That spirit, the same spirit, is present in this room as we gather together. Lord, for your presence, for the gifts that you give us in life, and the greater gift that you offer us in a life to come. We thank you that you have entrusted us with the responsibilities of life to care for others, to try to bring hope and common sense and healing to a broken world. What an awesome privilege you give to us. How can you use us? We have so little to offer, we think. But you say to us, you have great gifts and great opportunities. Don't squander them. Pray. And from your prayers, act. Be my instruments of good and healing in this life. O oh God, we ask of this in the name of the one showed us what true, good, and perfect human life is all about, Jesus Christ, your Son, in whose name we pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. For those of you who join us remotely, we want to remind you that we need your financial support to continue the ministry of this church. 
for the cause of Christ. This Wednesday, we gather and we prepare meals that will be packaged and delivered to the homeless in Syracuse. We may not be able to make a dent in all the problems of this world, but we can do something. And this church, small as it is, is committed to doing significant things for others. So we need your help. So those who join us remotely may send their donations to Kirkville, UMC, PO Box 97, Kirkville, New York, 130, and I'm missing the last digit again, 82, 13082. And we'll be very grateful for your support. May I have our ushers come forward at this time to receive this day's offering of our tithes and gifts. deserve the good that you bring our way. We thank you that you do not give us what we deserve. You are better to us than anything we deserve. Gracious Lord God, you give us our livelihood. You give us our homes, our families, our relationships. 
and you give us our opportunities and the individual gifts that we possess are all given by you that we might use them. Help us to recognize the many opportunities and gifts you've given to us that we might serve as you deserve. In the name of Jesus, we ask. Amen. Please, turn and greet one another with the peace and love of Jesus Christ, and reach out to a stranger in your midst. have picked on Nathan so much uh, because he's not the only one who's here that's a guest today. We also thank Debbie Mann who's here, and, uh, but she's not really a guest. She's here every month. She just uh, joins us on the third Sunday of the month usually, and so we praise God for that. Uh, we know we're missing the Mackies. I put a special fan for her because she was too toasty last week. She's not here, so you can pick on her about make, not making use of the fan this morning. But we also pray that she's doing okay, that she's uh, she has some health concerns herself. So uh, you might want to just check on her and say, you okay? And there's several others you might want to check on. Check on Harris, Harriet, or check on, uh, you know, Ann. And uh, if you want to sing her a song, Ann loves to sing to her. And she'll join along with you. But uh, there's opportunities we can care and share with one another. Please make use of I do want to share with you the word of God that comes to us this morning from the Gospel of Mark. Our several readings um, in the past several weeks and in the weeks to come have come from the Gospel of Mark. And uh, we have just finished a couple weeks ago a um, study of the Gospel of Mark. And right now on Wednesday afternoons, and we also broadcast that, and you can find that on our Facebook page, we broadcast a, a Bible study o'clock, and you can also interact with that Bible study if you're joining us at the distance uh, by texting my, my business number, and we'd we'll be glad to then entertain your observations and uh, your questions. Um, but uh, the lectionary has us in the Gospels to be in, in uh, the Gospel of Mark. So today, we revisit the Gospel of Mark, and I'm always amazed by what God does. Because what we're doing now in our Bible study before we begin the study of the Gospel of Luke, we're talking about the significance and meaning of baptism. And you'll notice in this reading, excuse me, I'm plugging it, it is because baptism is mentioned in this passage. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, Let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your glory. <laughs> you don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with? We can, they answered. 
Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John. Jesus called them all together and said, You know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over those under them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. But not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. The word of God for the people of God. Indeed. Consider these questions of life and faith. What do you think motivated the two brothers for asking this favor from Jesus? When have you prayed and realized on later that you did not realize the ramifications behind what you were asking for? Be careful what you ask. How does Jesus' life and teaching influence your view of true power and the use of your gifts? This uh, passage is not unfamiliar to you. You'll come across this passage in the Gospels. Well, there's usually four passages that could be selected by a pastor if they're following the lectionary. But the gospel passage comes around to us once every three years in the lecture. So if you've been in the church for any length of time, you're familiar with this passage. Not only this one, but it's also repeated in the gospel of Matthew, chapter 20. What's interesting is the difference between Matthew's rendition and also Mark's rendition. Of course, Mark is the briefest gospel, much like you'd like preachers to be. But what happens in Matthew is it is not the boys who come to Jesus and make this request, but rather his mother. We have to ask the question there, um, who was it that really wanted to make this request? Was it the boys? Or was it their mama? Mamas always want the best for their boys. It comes with the territory. I want the best for my children. I struggle sometimes as an adult with my children because they're adults now with what I think might be best. And as I interact with my grandchildren, there's sometimes I have to bite my tongue because there are sometimes uh, things that are said and done in ways that I think are not necessarily the way I do them then the way I do them is not necessarily perfect either. Because if they were perfect, I have perfect children who would do perfect things, and they don't. They do great things, though. They're good children. They're lovely adults. And I love them dearly. So was this merely their mom's desire to ask this question? Their mom's name was Salome. It's important for you to remember. She, you read of her at the resurrection of Jesus. Mary, not the mother of Jesus, didn't show up. Salome. Salome was. You see, Salome was Mary's sister. So James and John were cousins to Jesus. And John was the one who was following John the Baptist and which then responded as Jesus came to be baptized, if you remember. He is oftentimes not called by name. He calls himself the disciple Jesus loved. 
wasn't that he was arrogant, but maybe he was because these two boys were called the Sons of Thunder. And they were called the Sons of Thunder because at one occasion they came to Jesus as Jesus encountered some Samaritans who were half-believers, I guess. They had corrupted belief and, and Jews tended to hate the Samaritans because of that corruption from what they experienced in their own corruption and destruction of their country by the Babylonians. They had a resentment for the Samaritans. And so they said, do you want us, because they were giving Jesus a hard time, do you want us to call down fire from heaven? Kind of bold. A little bit arrogant in that way. Right? So Jesus called them the sons of thunder. important to know the background of who we're talking about. John was entrusted by Jesus with the care of his mom. He died on the cross. It was John who laid against Jesus' breast as they sat around the table. He had a special heart for John. Both James and John joined Peter as an inner circle of the disciples. They got the privilege of being present when Jesus raised Jairus' daughter to life. They were all privileged to be with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. He called them apart from the other disciples. And there were also there were other times closer to Jesus imagine if you were a disciple that you might look upon them and you might think that they were preferred. And most oftentimes when this passage is preached upon, from my remembrance, when I sat on your side, that the emphasis was on what Jesus taught about service. That we do not lord our gifts, our opportunities, or our positions over other people. We, it's not a matter of power, but rather a matter of service. And truly, that is what's involved here. But something else is involved here. I'd have us carefully consider our prayer life. See, to me, this is also, it struck me as prayer. When James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him, teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Now that's prayer. You and I pray from a distance. It's like that camera and some people join us for worship. We join Jesus so it feels like at a distance. Even though a spirit is here, Jesus knows what we need and what we want. But imagine what they had the opportunity they had the opportunity of speaking directly to Jesus, physically right in front of them. Just imagine if all of a sudden Jesus came through that front door, came in here and sat down on the second step here, and then said, no, oh, what is it you desire? Just imagine. I think, I don't know about you, but I'd be slow to get up. I wouldn't be that quick to run. In my heart, I might be. But the very privilege of being able to say to Jesus, eye to eye, I think it probably would be the eyes looking back at me as I was asking. It would make me reluctant. How about you? To have Jesus staring back in my face. Ouch. I don't know. Because I know about my prayers sometimes how shallow and selfish that they may be. But they had the opportunity to speak what they wanted. We want you to give us what we want. Isn't that what we do in our prayers? We want you to give us what we want. And that's okay with Jesus. Jesus wants us to know he's not always going to give us what we want. That's part of this passage too. And sometimes it is also, like in Matthew, it was a mother that came to express. Maybe that was their desire, too, and they expressed it to Mama. And Mama said, well, I'm going to make it happen. You know? 
This is my nephew. He's at the do he, he changed water into wine at my daughter's wedding. So I'm going. I know what he can do. My sons want this boy. My boys want this. I'm going to make sure they get it. So they want this. I. They're not gutsy enough to go ask Jesus. Then I'm going to do it for them. Now, doesn't that sound like a mother? How many mothers are praying for their sons? Ruth Peckham, who died at 105, she confessed to me when I would give her communion. Sometimes she would share with me, I don't know why I'm here. I'm glad I lived a long life, but uh, you know, now I'm almost deaf, totally deaf and blind. What is there left for me? Why am I here? And I could tell you what I told her at that time. God has a purpose. And as I listened to the witnesses of children and grandchildren, their life served a purpose. And one of the purposes of her life was to pray for her children and grandchildren. And she prayed well. And you could see the legacy of her frugal life built around prayer and service to God. I'd visit and she'd be knitting caps for premiums and cross. It's all she could do. She says, I cannot see, but I've done it so many times I can still do it. And I've got to do something. God put me here to do something. It's my job to find what that is. Not to complain, but to do it. Good witness and testimony. So, as a mother, she wanted the best for her boys, and so she went and dared to ask. So Matthew has it. But as we usually focus on this passage, we say, oh, that was terribly selfish. Isn't that also what we do? On our prayers, many times, terribly selfish. I want to ask you a question. What did James and John really want? I'm going to give you some possible answers to that. But I want you to reflect upon it. A close relationship with Jesus? Well, wait a second. They were his cousins. They were already following him closely, living with him for three years. Was it a close relationship with Jesus? You know, I'm going to be with you when you go to your glory. Now, it didn't say he wanted to be with them in their life. See, words are important to understand when you come into your glory. You see, Jesus had just finished in both Matthew and Mark of saying to them, this is what's going to happen to me. They understood the destiny of Jesus. They knew that he was going to bear the cross. And they knew that he was going to have glory in his Father's kingdom. And so one way we could look at their request is that we want to be with you, close to you, in glory. You thought about that, did you? We want to be close to Jesus. Have you ever prayed? I want to be closer. I could think of him as close to you, close to you, close to you, close to you, da 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 Oh, that blind woman that gave us that hymn. Do you ever a longing to be closer to Jesus? I pray you do. Because that longing is one of the fruits of our salvation. Most people take it they want power and position. You know, if you sit in a, next to a king in the right or the left, usually the, the wife or the queen would sit to the right and on the left would be the king's mom. And there was a position of status. It was a position of respect. It was a position of authority. Uh, you do something to mom and my wife, man, you've done something to me and it's not going to go well for you. But sometimes there are people that you'd have on your right and left means that I trust you. I trust you. And so they were saying to Jesus that I wanted that trust. Do you trust us? 
Do you trust us with power and position? Now, in this world, we know, as Jesus instructed all the disciples, that when you're in a position of trust, it's not about power and authority. Oh, if those in Washington, I don't care what party they're a part of, and other people in this life would realize that they're entrusted with gifts and responsibilities, it is a trust. And a trust is supposed to be lived up to. And that becomes where the hard work is. And it's not to lord it over to people. I'd love to see those who go to Washington not get paid a dime. Let them prove their commitment that we're here to serve. Most of them don't need the dime anyways. You and I need the dime. Jesus didn't ask for wealth. His disciples didn't ask for wealth. And this is Pastor Appreciation Month, and I, month, and I heard on Family Life an interview about with pastors. I'm very fortunate. The 75% live below the poverty level. And I think that's good. Because they're there to serve. More than 60% of pastors, and most people you think of the big names, 60% have other jobs. And that's good too. Paul had other jobs. Because they were there to serve, not to have power, not to have prestige. And in our culture right now, being a servant of God, as a pastor or clergy, there is no prestige to it. Maybe one time there was, but not now. And let me tell you, you are leaders in Christ's kingdom. And there's no prestige for you. And there's no power for you. Oh, there's power from Christ on high, but there is no prestige in this culture. What? You follow Jesus? You fool. But we know better. And Jesus was reminding that. We already talked about parental approval. Were they trying to get their mother's approval? Yeah, we want this position because then mom will be proud of us. How about spiritual security? I'm going to be with Jesus in glory. I want to be with him. I want to be with him. I want to know that as I draw close to the end of my life, and I'm drawing closer to the end of my life, and as I learn of Alex, a young man who I had in confirmation, I prayed with him, talked with him, prayed with him. Now he's gone. I thank God that I know Alex lives. I want to know that I'm going to live. I want that security that takes away the threat and pain of death to my life. This life, and I believe it, is not all there is. And I'll live and die on that. Because no matter what happens, I'm going to die on that. We choose. How we're going to die, we choose how we're going to live. How will you choose this day? You know, these, Jesus said to them, Are you sure that you can bear what I'm going to bear, that you can bear the baptism that I've been baptized with? There's that word baptism again. Jesus was baptized in the Jordan by, by John. His baptism was a baptism meaning that I accept fully what God's will is for my life. He was already without sin. He did not need that type of perfection, but he did so, as he told John, to fulfill all righteousness. Because what I'm expecting of everyone else, I expect of myself. Do you expect from other people what you expect of yourself? Jesus said, I expect I'm going to die. And I'm willing to accept it. Are you willing to die? And I'm not talking about your physical death. You don't have a choice over that. But you have a choice in life of how you're going to live. Are you going to die to yourself and live unto Jesus Christ? Can you accept that? Jesus asked them. 
Can you accept the fact that just as I'm going to the cross, I just told you that, that if you follow me, you might go to the cross as well. People are not going to like you. People may reject you. They may treat you as a stupid idiot for following Jesus Christ. Praise God, think of me as a stupid idiot. And they said, we can. And then Jesus says, you know, you're right. You will share my baptism. And what he meant by that is we find in their lives. So James was the first apostle to be killed. Herod chopped off his head. John lived in Ephesus and was known as Turkey now. He then planted and served as what we would call now the bishop of that territory. He stood firm for Christ and then he was planted by Rome into a pot of oil to be boiled to death. A mistake happened. It didn't get hot enough. Instead, he had a wonderful oily bath that made his skin nice and smooth. But because of Roman law, they couldn't execute him again in the same way. Isn't that wonderful that there's some laws? So they got him out. Instead, they put him on an island of Patmos. And there he bribed sailors to take back letters because he still was a person who was living his service to Christ. We have his letters. We have his gospel. We also have the book of Revelation. He suffered. He died an old man. He was the last one to die, but his life necessarily was not present in this world. They were to be baptized with the same baptism that Jesus had. We are going to be baptized with the same baptism. If we're going to follow, it's not always going to be easy. But it will be wonderful. Because Jesus will be with us. He then said no to their prayer. What about your prayer life? I know what you want. But I can't give it to you. Has Jesus ever said no to your desires and what you want? And he gave us a clue to prayer. He says, because those positions have been prepared for those who shall receive them. Each of us have a destiny. There is a plan and a purpose. Our goal is not to live up into our purpose and our plan, but to follow and discover what is God's purpose in our lives. So when the Lord's Prayer says, Thy will be done, be careful what you pray for. I'm going to confess to you, I think I'm a better preacher than some people I've heard on the radio and TV. Isn't that arrogant of me? But at the same time, I'm not going to be on radio and TV. I'm not going to be in some of those positions. Why? Because it's not God's purpose and design for me. I am me. God has a plan for me. God has a plan for you. The freedom and beauty of life is discovering not what our plans and wants would be, but what God wants for us. Abandoning ourselves fully to chasing after. Not our dream. God's dream. And then all of a sudden, somewhere along the way, God's dream miraculously becomes our dream. not a matter of having authority and power over other people. You and I have no authority and power except to serve. God calls us to serve. Can you accept the baptism of service? Can you accept the baptism which means you may not get the recognition that you feel you deserve? Can you accept then the baptism that in serving in ways that people don't want you to serve 
I've lost friends. Have you lost friends? Because I will stand my ground and I will not buy into the lies that some of them live by. And I know of others who still struggle with following Jesus Christ. Yet, when they have problems, you get the call, you get the email, the text message. Service is, does not come with the rewards of greatness or power. But you will have the opportunity of influence in your life, in your dying. And to follow Jesus Christ requires us to die to what we think our life should be. To take on the life greater life, fuller life that God offers us through Jesus Christ. Thank you for allowing me to chew your ear. I then want to have you stand if you would. We have a beautiful hymn that we'll sing, Are You Able? It's found 530 unless I broke the number one this sung to us by an Asian young woman that we sing along with. And I hope you can hear within her voice the passion and the commitment. May we have that same passion. May we have that same commitment.
Lord be with us, even as we take this time from serious matters to jovial matters. Be with us as we partake of nourishment that you have provided for us by loving hands, caring hearts. May we enjoy the fellowship around the table. May we enjoy the fellowship you give us with those at a distance. Thank you for your love that is evident to us in so many different ways, but is oftentimes taken for granted make us able because we want to be able so fill us with your love and with your joy and your peace for we ask this in the name of Jesus have a good and godly day